Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is artist and writer Jerry Ordway. Jerry, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you very much. Now, Jerry, you are um, someone who's worked uh, on a number of really high profile books, whether it's All Star Squadron or Superman. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, as you are working throughout your career, how do you go and make the transition from somebody who's maybe just an inker to someone who's a penciler to somebody who's now writing and penciling his own book? Well, the, the transition's always difficult because I think once you're doing a certain job, if people like what you're doing, they don't want you to move. I mean, I'm sure it's like that in other industries. But in comics, it was hard to, to break out from inking to penciling because you're kind of known as an inker and people are really resistant to, you know, they, it was a, it was a struggle with writing. I kind of fell into it. Um, I always had ideas and I would add them into stories, whether I got credit or not, but uh, I was basically just in the right place at the right time when uh, on Superman, when John Byrne left, uh, I'd even suggested to my editor possible writers to replace him. And he shot back. He said, well, what, why don't you do it yourself? And I was like, oh, can I do that? You know, it was something that I'd always wanted to do, but at the same time, you get kind of uh, into a routine and it's, you know, hard to switch gears in a way, too, to do something scary, which it <clears throat> ultimately was very scary to make that transition. You know, around the same time you, you mentioned uh, your work on Superman, you had been doing some, uh, some work prior to that with Roy Thomas on All-Star Squadron and Infinity Incorporated, and you're doing, you know, pencil work there. Uh, but then you, you take a, a moment to do uh, ink work over on the Fantastic Four for John Byrne. So <laughs> when you make that move, is, is this, I mean, I don't know how, how the career hierarchy works, but, you know, moving over from, from pencils to inks, and obviously, you know, you, you do more embellishment. How do you sort of make that move and, and you know, keep that momentum going? Well, <clears throat> I'd gone from uh, working on p penciling on All-Star Squadron and then penciling and co-creating Infinity, Infinity Inc. And after I'd kind of burned out on that, I went over to, to work on uh, Fantastic Four, mainly because I was a big John Byrne fan. And I also realized, I mean, this Fantastic Four sold, I think, 250,000 copies a month at that time. And All-Star Squadron Infinity Inc. sold less than 100. <clears throat> so I knew going there that John was the star and I was basically support. So ego-wise, it's not a problem. I also specifically told uh, Mike Carlin, who first time I worked with him, I said, I just want to do this to recharge. I, did, I just want to recharge batteries. I wasn't like backsliding or I didn't want to ink, you know, full time. It was an interesting challenge. Again, it's like when you're working on your own stuff and you're penciling your own stuff, you're drawing from whatever comics you read, you know, it's a different, I want to say it's a different mindset when you're a penciler versus when you're inking. When you're a penciler, you're all about story and you're all about adapting some outline to make it into a story. With inking, it's, it's pretty much a technical thing. I guess it would be the difference between cutting your grass and <clears throat> maybe building a deck, you know? I mean, they're both technical skills, but one probably requires more brain power or more uh, creativity and cutting your grass, you know, I mean, building a deck. So, you know, I, I, I went from inking burn on Fantastic Four, then I wound up getting um, enticed by DC to come back and work on Crisis over George Perez. And I guess the burn, you know, lesson was good because when I came to Crisis, I knew George was the star. So my job I knew was to be supportive. I was, you know, I basically was on there, you know, in both cases, I wound up increasing my profile by being on books that sold better. And they had, you know, both guys had huge fan bases. So I think I introduced myself to a lot of, you know, new fans. So it's like a win-win. And it's not, again, it's not about ego. When you're in a, a, a crisis situation, like, no pun intended, any book is a deadline problem, potentially. So you just have to knuckle down and do it, you know, um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a kind of fun technical skill, and I've, I enjoy jumping into doing an ink job here or there just for fun. I used to do that with Jurgens during the '90s. You know, he'd say, "Hey, I'm doing this project, or I'm doing a one shot," and it'd be okay. That's fun because it's fun to work on somebody else's you know pencils because you see, well, they did something different than you would have done. You know, they laid out a story page, or 
set up some, you know, element in a story differently than you might have. And that kind of helps. I guess it helps your perspective when you're working in a, you know, a studio by yourself. It kind of gives you a sense of what other people are doing, which you don't necessarily get until something's out in print, you know, and you pick it up at a comic store. Yeah, it was fun. And, and I, I picked up little tips, I think, I guess, uh, from both working on John and George. Um, they both had specific kind of things that were their strengths, and they both had things that I felt like I could help them with. So I found like I found my place in both uh, collaborations. But John's really good at texture stuff. Like his pencils were loaded with like implied pencil textures. A lot of people, you know, didn't really add textures. A lot of inkers have just one kind of style. Um, but if you're doing rocks or you're doing something that's like wood or whatever, you know, you use your pen and you try to imply whatever it is without having color. So in other words, when the colorist who would get the pages, they would immediately know this is supposed to be wood, this is supposed to be rock, this is supposed to be glass. And a lot of inkers generally don't do that, you know, and pencilers sometimes don't impl don't put that in their pencils either. So as a penciler, I always try for clarity. As an inker, it's even more important to have clarity because I think it informs the coloring and maybe sometimes can be over heavy handed. But comics are really, at that time especially, they weren't a place for subtlety. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you, you didn't really have much subtlety, so everybody overacts. You know, they use their hands or they, you know, they're, they, don't, they say something normal, but their face is, you know, tensed or whatever. And the same is true when you're, when you're inking something is you want to add extra black, you want to thicken a line because it helps the drawing kind of pop out or a figure separate from the background. So those are all like, uh, those are really things that happen at the ink stage. Even if a penciler pencils really tightly and puts all that implied thickness of line for an inker, sometimes you get a good job. Sometimes people don't interpret it correctly. So, uh, yeah, I'm always, I'm, I always try for clarity. And again, that's part of, I guess, going from my school days. Um, I had high school art and my art teacher used to talk about you're communicating with drawing. You're trying to communicate an idea. And uh, he was all for making sure that your idea was communicated by being clear, you know, being concise. I guess those are lessons that you, you know, you absorb when you're 17 or 16 or whatever. And you kind of find a way to apply them, you know, later on. At the time, they sound stupid, <laughs> you know, but you find a way to apply these things uh, when you're actually in the in the situation of inking a page or penciling a page. Now, you, you talked about how you wanted to maybe do some inking to recharge your batteries. Is there something that uh, working with another penciler that you can look at and and see how they solve a problem and maybe then start to think about how you would solve the problem? And then maybe you could apply that to a future project that you're working on. Oh yeah, I mean it's. It, I think that's the fun part about comics. Uh, for me, it always was the fun part was that you could take something and you know create a a team. You know, if you have the same several people working together, you have a the, like in my case when I was on Superman, I had worked out with a bunch of different inkers, and then Dennis Janky came on, and Dennis became the regular inker on Superman. And you share information, you learn from what people do. I mean, the same is true with stories. You know, I mean, you you see how somebody approaches something. It's different than reading a comic that's totally completed, because when you're working on a on a whatever Fantastic Four, Superman, whatever it is, it starts with a plot or an outline, and the outline is adapted to visual. This is called Marvel style. The outline would be adapted, the artist would take the outline and break it down, sometimes into 22 pages, sometimes the writer would break their outline into, here's page one, here's page two, whatever. So you're seeing all the steps, like watching a cooking show and seeing somebody like, oh look, they put a pinch of this in there and that's the secret ingredient. Being part of those uh, collaborations, you always see someone else's little pinch of something. And you you know, you know, wind up incorporating it into your own work if it fits. If it doesn't fit, I mean, not every aspect that you encounter works for you, but you can still admire it. You just think, wow, I could never get away with that. And that's true with uh, with writing as well, I think, because so much of it is, even though you're working for a client like DC or Marvel or whatever company, and usually on a company character, you can't do tremendously groundbreaking things unless they let you. Generally, they just have you 
take a character in a direction, but then return it to its original uh, position, you know. Um, but I think, anyways, I, I think the collaboration aspect, like when I worked with Jurgens, Dan would do stuff that would sometimes, I would go, wow, that's really cool. Sometimes I'd go, wow, that's really awkward. So it works both ways, but you still respect when somebody goes out on a limb, like with a crazy pose or a, a weird angle or something like that. But that's why I say like not every every little uh, artistic thing applies and is something that you can do. George Perez, George was able to pack so much story by drawing characters so small, but yet he, you know, he did it in an interesting way. I mean, I always was in, in admiration of that. I, it's very hard to do. If ever you work with a, like a collaborator writer and a writer asks you to draw a nine panel page, you know that if it's got nine panels on it, each of those nine panels potentially have word balloons. So those word balloons take up real estate basically on each panel, right? So you have to work towards what space the writer might need. With George, George was just really good at figuring out where the dead space might be that you know, Marv or whoever would add balloons, uh, dialogue or whatever. Uh, that's a hard thing to learn, you know? And I guess that's something I'm critical of when I look at new comics. I'll look at a, a new comic and I'll immediately be like, wow, I can't believe they put the word balloon over that guy's chest or over their shoulder or something, you know? I mean, it, you develop kind of a, a feel for what looks right to you. Ultimately, I still go, wow, I'm not doing it. It's not my job. But uh, I think, you know, little things like that, I'll, you know, you, you can't help but nitpick sometimes. I mean, it doesn't take away from overall respect for the job because it's a hard job. I mean, it's a lot of hours put into it, you know. One of the things I, I, I think is, is sort of your signature um, is, well, you are very good at using um, non-ink. Uh, you're using uh, Zipatone in some of your... Your panels, and I think back to the Fantastic Four, where suddenly Reed Richards is stretching, but there's this cool texture that was never there before that's there, and, and you know it's sort of one of your signatures. So when you're looking at the um, at that page and you're you're thinking about whether it should be pen or brush, where do you start to think about where it could be something else? Honestly, you get into a rhythm with it, and you just do it. Except for maybe one or two jobs, I've. I've inked with a pen and then I go back at the later stage with a brush to fill in or to heavy up a line or something. Um, but yeah, with, I mean, you, when you look at stuff, I tell, I'll tell you, sometimes I'll look at a page, um, a good example to bring up Byrne again, John Byrne, he would draw a very textured, again, he was really good at like, here's the texture of a street and it could be, wow, you know, you don't think about this, but it's something that clearly came from him moving east from Canada, being in the New York area, is he gave his New York City scenes a lot more atmosphere and, and stuff than, than kind of generic comic book New York would be. He used to draw garbage bags piled up on the streets, and the street could be, even though it, was, it wasn't raining, there could be a wet sidewalk. You know, he did stuff like that. He would always think, you know, there'd be graffiti on the wall or, or, uh, or, or things like that. So when I would get a page like that, the problem as far as inking being just following the lines is if somebody just followed the lines, it wouldn't look good because pencil is a different medium than ink. And even if you draw with the idea that this line is going to be a thick ink line, it doesn't always work. Um, in the old days, now everybody pencils and inks, and they, I guess they're printing out blue lines with their printer on you know, Strathmore paper and inking. In the old days, you would get pages to, you know, uh, via FedEx or whatever, and you'd look at the pencils, and the pencils would have the word balloons on it, so you didn't have to ink behind, you know what I mean? If there was like 15 captions, you could ink around them. You didn't have to ink behind them so that they could put, put in digitally. It wasn't, there was no wasted, you know, wasted effort there. But you would look at a page, and I would sit down and I would ink it with my pen, usually just using a crow quill, uh, like a Hunt 102 was, was pretty much my go-to for a long time, a dip pen. I would ink all the lines. And then I would erase the pencils. Like you, if there's going to be black areas, you put a little X for, as a reminder for yourself. You X it out. And then you erase it. And then you look at it fresh. With It's actually you, you're looking at it for the first time just in ink. And that page will look very light. 
like, oh, my God, this looks terrible. And that's when you have to go in and you have to start thickening lines. And sometimes, again, you'll be working really nice textures and stuff. And you kind of just another art thing from school squint at something. And when you squint at it, you lose the, the detail and it becomes a mass. So I would squint at a page and I'd say, well, all these, you know, I might have put in all kinds of texture with the pen on, say, a brick background. That's going to work better if I just fill it in black. And that's the stage of finishing the inks that I learned that somehow. And, you know, I don't know if I, I no one taught me how to do that. That's always the most important stage for me in inking is to look at the page without the pencils because it shows you where you need to, you know, create some kind of depth. And it, again, a lot of comics, old style comics, they would put really thick lines around everything because the printing process was so crude that you needed a thick black line just so that the color wouldn't print off register, you know? Um, so I was fortunate that when I got into comics, printing was always, you know, was a couple of years away from being more accurate. So I didn't have to, you know, use a very thick, you know, magic marker or something to ink some. But you still need to create a depth and a, and a, and a punch. That's the best way you could put it. I used to always say it, it needed oomph. And that was with what you do with either a thick brush line or a zip -a tone zip -a tone could do it too. Sometimes it just needed something to separate a figure from the background or, again, in the, in the interest of clarity. So no matter what the pencil or how tight the pencils could be, at some point, you're still going to have to do something to make it print ready. And those are lessons you learn as you do, you know, as you work on stuff. I think my first couple jobs, they were very much learning experiences because I didn't know what would print and what wouldn't print because it was the days of the old style. It was a, an oil-based ink, but it was like a relief. So the, it wasn't an offset press, you know, where a plate is flat. It was actually a raised printing area, old style the same presses that were used at the very beginning of comics. We're still churning out comics in the 80s, which is kind of nuts to think about. But you always had to judge. You couldn't, sometimes Zipatone wouldn't, you know, you couldn't use a Zipatone that was too dark because it would fill in and it would just be a mess. That was all a learning experience, you know? And that's part of the technical aspect of it. It, it had something to do with creativity in that you would still try to figure out a way to get an extra depth or whatever uh, and still have it read right, you know. Um, but those are, again, that was fun, a fun experience and fun times because it really was a period where maybe first year or two where I found out what worked and what didn't. And I suppose artists probably still go through that when they see the fr finished printed book or whatever and they think, oh, I should have, this should have been a black background or this should have been shadow or whatever. I mean, I don't think, I think, I imagine everybody does it. I know I do. You're always second guessing even after it's done. <laughs> Two years later, three years later, you go, why didn't I do this? Well, it's, it's interesting because I've, I've never heard uh, someone say erase, once you put down the line, erase the, the, the pencil and you get a whole new look on the page. That, that is. Yeah. Well, see, here's the thing though. When you have a pencil drawing and again, the pencilers that worked would always pencil for they knew it was going to be inked. So it was always, there was a roughness to it. There could be double lines, you know, that you could still see sometimes, a lot of times you'd see the underdrawing, you know, the little layout or whatever. So it wasn't like you were getting a pristine uh, finished thing that you could actually just follow the lines. You always have to interpret. When you're penciling your hand, this part of your hand is, if you're a right-hander or left-hander, the pad of your hand is going to be smearing a little bit of the, of the, pencil. So you tend to get a little bit of a gray all over quality. And when you put ink on that and then you erase it, it's like taking a, pulling a, a window shade or something. It's suddenly very vivid and it really becomes a different thing. And that's why I say like pencil drawing versus ink drawing is very, it's a different discipline. And sometimes pencilers have tried to become inkers and have just either they're too, too used to penciling. They don't understand the technical side of it. I mean, that's, uh, that certainly has happened in the past. But now it's less of an issue, I think, because a lot of, uh, there are a lot more people doing their own pencils and inks um, rather than one guy doing pencils, another person, you know, coming in and inking it. So that, that part of the business has changed uh, just, I think, mostly because of the digital aspect of it. Uh, companies don't want to spend money to, I mean, if they can help it, they don't want to spend money to send pencil pages 
through FedEx or mail or whatever. But in a lot of cases, it's just an extra step that the editor has to wait and maybe worry about a deadline being, you know, fulfilled if they have to wait on somebody to ink pages as well. So, you know, a lot of new people, I think, have come up with uh, ways to do shortcuts so that they can, you know, do a 20 page comic every month. Um, that's always the goal. It's like to get as much creativity as you can and still make your deadline. You were uh, a part of the team uh, during my personal favorite run of Superman. Uh, and you were responsible for co-creating or creating a number of uh, characters that have become part of the, the Superman or Supergirl uh, television uh, series and films, uh, characters like Cat Grant. Um, so can you talk a little bit about you know, when you're writing uh, for yourself, are you sitting down and typing up a plot and then maybe doing a, a script or are you just sitting down at the board and saying, I've got an idea and I'll, I'll just get started? And then how do you sort of shift that when you are just the writer of the book and you're handing it off to a pencil artist? Well, again, comics are, are like a unique creative kind of outlet. If you're like when I was penciling and I started writing, I had to I couldn't just make it up as I went along. I had to create a plot because there were other people working on other Superman books. So it was a way of being fair to somebody else that if you were doing some sequence or whatever, they would know, oh, Lois Lane is going to be, you know, trapped in a well <laughs> or something. Whatever it is, that part has to go, like if someone's drawing, you know, the Superman books, for anybody who doesn't know, Superman books, we had like three and then it became four a month and there were different creative teams on each one and our storylines generally were separate except for we would run subplots that would run across the books. So Jimmy Olsen or <clears throat> Lex Luthor or something, there could be storylines that would run across. So we had to, in fairness to Dan Jurgens or Louise Simonson or Roger Stern, everybody had to know where, what you were going to be doing in that issue a couple months in advance. I would adapt my plot and I would start doing layouts. I could still, if I came up with an idea that was better that didn't affect what other people were doing, I could still make changes. And uh, a lot of times that happens. Um, again, it was the beauty, the beauty of the way this, this kind of assembly line system worked, but I would do layouts um, from my plot. So the plot would, again, I'm working on issue 20. I would be plotting issue 22, the plot should be done while I'm working on 20 so that the other writers can work on their stuff, right? So by the time I get to issue 22 to start laying it out, I might have rethought things like, oh, wait, that works better this way or whatever. So generally, I would sit down with my drawing paper and I would do kind of stick figure panel borders. I would lay out the page. I would kind of indicate dialogue so I knew how much space and how it was going to be laid out, but I did not do finished penciling. I would go, then go to the typewriter and I would work on my script, my dialogue, captions, what have you, and I would send out batches of, say, five to six pages to the letterer, you know, New York to editorial, and they would pass it to the editor, depending on how, whatever, how much they needed to read it in advance. I would get multiple chances at a story if I was drawing it that I also wrote it. I was getting that time basically that you wouldn't have if you had to do it all in one month. So two months later after plotting it, I can kind of think maybe, oh, this might be a better way to do the story. I can lay it out that way. Then I send it to the letterer. I get lettered boards back with the panel borders and the dialogue all in it. And then I would tighten up the drawing. So I was getting almost like a fresh set of eyes each time because there was always going to be a gap of time. You know, whether it was two months or two weeks, um, that's always good because you could constantly refine, you know, an idea or uh, even change a panel angle or whatever, as long as it didn't affect the word balloons. You know, you could change a figure or whatever. But it was I really like working that way, because um, a lot of times when you're when you just have one shot at something, you you wind up with regrets because you look at it later and you go. Why didn't I do a reverse angle or why didn't I, you know, I mean, it's always something that, you know, you wish you'd had a chance to do, which we did have a chance to do when we were working on Superman and, and even Shazam. Right. And with Superman and Shazam, both were done with other artists. I just basically used to try to, I would use lessons of things that, that I liked and I didn't like working with other writers. So I would always try to keep my plot 
from having too many panels, which was a problem with other writers when I was working with them. It was like, I don't want to do a 22 page story with nine panel pages because it doesn't breathe. There's no big, you know, there's no way to make it exciting. I would plot stuff for Tom Grummet or for uh, Pete Krause, who was on Shazam. And I would try to give them at most, this is going to be a six panel page. If you need to make it into seven, that's on you. If you feel like there's an inset panel you can add, it's it's totally on you. You can do it. But I didn't want to overburden them. And I always tried to give them double page spreads with panels underneath because it was also a lesson that I learned when I was working on um, any deadline. You, it's always pushing a rock up the hill. And then once you're at the hill, say halfway through, the rest of that, the second half of the job goes faster because you get the momentum and you're like, oh, I'm already 10 pages in or 11 pages in. Then it, it goes faster towards the end. I would always build in a double page spread because I knew that the first page was generally a splash page. Second and third page could be a big panel on top with maybe five panels going across. That would give the artist the point where they would suddenly be on page four and they go, hey, I'm into this job. I'm getting my, you know, momentum. So those were things I did just because I liked the idea of it. And I also felt like that helped. Um, there's nothing worse than having a, 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 pl a plot or a story that's really, really hard right at the beginning because you don't get a chance to get any momentum. I mean, that's what comics and monthly comics are all about, momentum and deadlines. Well, Jerry, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to have to interrupt you here. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time and it seems like we're barely scratching okay. the surface. But I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk oh, with thank me. thank you. And Sorry I, about being too long-winded with my... <laughs> no, it was great. I, I appreciate it. And I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.